This is the story of Independent Air Flight 1851. On the 8th of February 1989, an Independent Air Boeing 707 was flying from Bergamo, Italy to the Puna Cana Airport in the Dominican Republic with a stopover at the Santa Maria Airport in the Azores. Independent Air was a charter airline that was operational from 1996 to 1990. And as you would expect, today's flight was a charter flight as well. On the ground at Bergamo, the crew worked out how much fuel they'd need for the flight to the Dominican Republic. They fueled the plane up with 30,000 kilos, or 68,000 pounds of fuel for the flight. That gave them enough fuel to fly there, divert, and hold over airports should they need to. The plane departed Bergamo at 10 a.m. UTC two hours behind schedule, as the previous flight was a bit late. At this rate, they'd arrive in Santa Maria at 2.05 p.m. UTC. At 1.44 p.m., Flight 1851 requested for a METAR for Santa Maria Airport. A METAR is a way of reporting meteorological data. It stands for Meteorological Terminal Aviation Routine Weather Report. That's a mouthful. And it gives you all the data that you need to know about the weather at and around the airport in question wind speeds, cloud layers, all that sort of stuff. Today was a very cloudy day. As per the METAR, the crew calibrated their altimeters to the QNH value of 1019. The QNH value is used to calculate the altitude of the plane above sea level. There is another value called QFE, and that is used to calculate the altitude of the plane above the ground. The QNH and QFE values depend upon where you're flying into, and you have to use the values that ATC or the ATIS system gives you. Two minutes later, with the plane still in contact with the Santa Maria area control, the plane was allowed to descend to 4,000 feet. At 1.56 p.m., the plane passed the echo waypoint. The plane transferred to the tower frequency on 118.1. The tower cleared them in. Independent Air 1851, Roger re-cleared to 3,000 feet on QNH 1027, and runway will be 19er. Expect ILS approach, runway 19er. Report reaching 3,000. The tower had cleared them to 3,000 feet. The co-pilot responded with, re-cleared to 2,000 feet and, uh, 1027. Someone else in the cockpit pointed the co-pilot's mistake out. Make it 3,000, they said. They were cleared to 3,000 feet and not 2,000. The pilot set their altitude alert system to 2,000 feet. The altitude alert system would warn them if they deviated from the set altitude by a significant margin. In most cases, it would trigger if the plane was 300 feet below or 900 feet above the selected altitude. The crew then turned their attention towards the preliminary landing checklist. They ticked off items on the checklist. The co-pilot told the captain that he was going to tune the ILS. The co-pilot continued... After 2,000 feet, we'll get below these clouds. The captain replied with, In case we don't, 187 is the outbound, referring to the heading that they had to fly in case they did not sight the runway. At 2.08 and 5 seconds UTC, the GPWS system sounded in the cockpit. It blared for 7 seconds. There was no comment or reaction from the crew. People near the parish of Santa Barbara saw the plane low over their town, and it was flying much lower than what other airplanes flew. It was headed straight for the Pico Alto mountain. The plane disappeared into the clouds. The witnesses on the ground could not see the plane anymore, but they did hear it. They heard it crash into the Pico Alto mountain with a gut-wrenching crash. None of the 144 people on board made it. The weather at and around Pico Alto was not ideal. Investigators described the weather as being instrument meteorological conditions. Therefore, it is unlikely that they saw the mountain in the flight's last few seconds. The investigators found out that the plane was flying from the echo reporting point to the VOR at the airport. This brought to light some of the issues that the crew was facing. At the start of their approach into Santa Maria, the crew were cleared to Echo Sierra Mike Alpha, their final fix. They had trouble understanding this information. They got their final fix wrong two times, so the crew had some issues in understanding their terminal clearance. So due to this confusion, the crew flew directly towards the VSM VOR from the echo point. They should not have done this. The approach calls for them to fly towards an NDB near the airport and then to the airport itself. Had they done this, they would have missed the mountain. But that does not explain the accident. Eyewitnesses said that airliners often flew over the parish as they approached the airport, meaning that other planes also flew towards the VSM VOR. The route published had a safety buffer of about 5 nautical miles on both sides. 
the plane was well within the safety buffer. Other planes did the same thing that the crew did. So what made Flight 1851 so special? Going over the ATC transcripts, they found more things that went wrong. A METAR was published at 1.54 p.m. UTC. When the controller was clearing the plane down to 3,000 feet, the controller gave the crew the wrong QNH value. The QNH is basically just a measure of pressure. The plane's computers can accurately calculate the plane's altitude only if it is calibrated with the correct QNH slash QFE value. The QNH value that the controller gave was 1027, whereas the correct value was 1018. The investigators found that, due to this mistake, the plane was 240 feet lower than what the altimeter showed. But that still does not explain the crash. The controller cleared them to 3,000 feet. Even if they were 240 feet below 3,000, it would have given them more than enough clearance to clear the mountain. The investigators' attention now turned towards the actions of the crew. Did they make a mistake? After being cleared in for the ILS approach onto runway 19, the crew should have conducted an approach briefing, but they never did. Had they done that, they would have known that the minimum safe altitude for the area was 3,000 feet. Moreover, the mountain of Pico Alto was also clearly marked on the charts. They listened on. They heard the controller cleared the plane down to 3,000 feet, the correct altitude, and then they heard the co-pilot say that they were cleared to 2,000 feet. Someone in the cockpit corrected him by saying 3,000 feet, but that was the end of that. No further discussion on the matter was recorded. Moreover, no one objected when 2,000 feet was entered as the altitude alert value. Strangely, even as the GPWS warning sounded, the crew did nothing. They had ample time to react. The average reaction time is 5.4 seconds, but this crew did nothing. They looked back into the training records of the crew. They looked at the training that the crew got for dealing with GPWS alerts. They had little to no training in this regard, which explained why it took so long for them to react. Independent Air Simulator training was done on simulators owned by other airlines, and their simulators were set up a bit differently than the planes that Independent Air owned, and some of them had their GPWS systems turned off. Here's a quote. Thus, because a simulator's GPWS would activate during normal approaches, instructors usually disabled the GPWS or instructed the students to not react when the GPWS would sound." End quote. Their poor training went beyond the lack of GPWS training. The board was of the opinion that their training was lacking, in general, as the crew had shortcomings in multiple areas. For example, the crew had limited experience with international operations. This may not seem like such a big deal, I mean, flying is flying, but the FAA had noticed that the North American air crews had a hard time dealing with accents even if their English was fluent. Therefore, the FAA had asked the inspectors to scrutinize international operators a bit more. But one final question remains. How did the crew miss the transmission from the controller that clearly asked them to descend to 3,000 feet? As it turned out, there was a slight overlap in the communication of the pilots and the controller the co-pilot started to read back their clearance too soon, and so the controller did not notice the crew's mistake. The crew did not hear the part where the controller had asked them to report when they were at 3,000 feet. The controller said, Independent 1851, Roger, you're cleared to 3,000 feet on QNH 1027, and a uh, runway will be one niner. End quote. Then at 156.58, the trainee controller paused, and at 156.59, the trainee controller continued speaking. Expect ILS approach runway 19er, report reaching 3000. The last part of this message was not recorded on the CVR of the plane. As with most crashes, the story of Independent Air 1851 has a long list of factors that contributed to it. A crew that was not well versed in international operations, a non-adherence to standard operating procedures, flying too low, and an inability to respond to a GPWS warning in time. After this crash, the FAA wanted greater scrutiny on overseas operators. They also wanted periodic reviews of the operations of overseas operators and reviews of their training programs. The FAA also wanted minimum levels of experience to be set for pilots flying internationally. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. A big thank you to Ryan Bomar for letting me use his amazing footage on my videos. I'll catch you guys next time. Stay safe.